A little while ago, I made the video A Swift Introduction to Geometric Algebra. Since making it, I've realized that there were a few things that were either misleading or unclear in it, so I decided to create this addendum that should hopefully clear these things up. Now I have been working on a series called From Zero to Geo where I'm going to be covering all of these issues, and I initially thought that that would be good enough for clearing up the misunderstandings. However, it seems that many more people have been watching my Swift introduction than From Zero to Geo, so I realized that it might be a good idea to make a separate video. In this video, I'm going to be assuming that you have seen the Swift introduction and understood most of it. So if you haven't seen it yet, you should probably watch it before watching this one. Most of this video will be giving intuitive descriptions of the geometric product and describing the direct consequences of these descriptions, which is the one area that the original video was severely lacking in. However, before we do that, I want to clear up some common misunderstandings that I've seen. This should only take a minute or two. The first thing I want to say is that many people confuse the outer product that I gave with another operation commonly called the outer product. These two operations are not the same and have little to do with each other. The geometric algebra outer product takes in two vectors and produces a bivector, while the other outer product takes in two vectors and produces a matrix or a tensor. Some people distinguish between the two by calling the geometric algebra outer product the wedge product or the exterior product, while the other outer product is just a special case of the tensor product. I still prefer the name outer product for the operation in geometric algebra for reasons I'll give later in this video. Another common misunderstanding I've seen relates to all of these facts that I presented in the previous video. While these statements are true for all vectors, if we consider arbitrary multi-vectors, it turns out that there are exceptions to all of them. I will admit that this misunderstanding is partially my fault because I presented the vector equations with no caveats in the Swift introduction. Now some of you might be surprised by this last one. I had used this equation for vectors as my original definition of the geometric product, but if it's not true for arbitrary multi-vectors, just what is the geometric product? For the rest of this video, we will be exploring two different ways to understand the geometric product. Note that I will be trying to give intuitive explanations for the geometric product, not concrete explanations, so I will gloss over the details of how to use these explanations to fully calculate a product. In fact, because scalars can be moved around freely in a product, the main thing that we need to understand the geometric product is to understand the orientation of everything involved, not the magnitude. Thus, I will purposely ignore scalar factors, and the magnitude of some of my results may be incorrect as a result. The point of this video is to understand the orientation of the result of a geometric product, not to actually calculate the geometric product. If you want to actually calculate a product, just use these equations that I gave you last video. So let's now forget about any preconceptions that we might have about multiplying vectors. Let's forget about the geometric product, the inner and outer products, and any other products between vectors that we might be aware of. From this standpoint, let's ask the question, what is the product of two vectors? Let's start with two parallel vectors. We will define the product of two parallel vectors to be the product of their lengths. Because u has a length of 2 and v has a length of 3, the product of these two vectors is 6. If the vectors are pointing in opposite directions, let's make their product the negative of the product of their lengths. Because the length of each of these vectors is the square root of 5, this would mean that the product of these two vectors is negative 5. Now that we've defined the product of parallel vectors, let's move on to perpendicular vectors. If we were to define the product of perpendicular vectors to be the product of their lengths again, we would lose many useful properties like associativity, so we won't do that. Instead, think about this bivector. The area of this bivector is equal to the product of the lengths of the vectors, so let's define the product of two perpendicular vectors to be this bivector that the two vectors make. We can now extend this by linearity to multiply any two vectors. For example, let's say we wanted to multiply these two vectors. To do this, we can take this perpendicular line and then use it to split v into two parts, one which is parallel to u and the other which is perpendicular to u.
At this point, we can distribute. Now the first term is the product of two parallel vectors, which we know is the product of their lengths, and the second term is the product of two perpendicular vectors, which we know is this bivector. Notice that we can think of this as splitting the product into two pieces, one where we multiply u with the part of v that is inside u, and the other where we multiply u with the part of v that is outside u. Thus, we call these two parts of the whole product the inner and outer products. We can use the same ideas to start defining multiplication between any two multivectors. The main idea is that when multiplying, things that are parallel cancel each other, and things that are perpendicular join together. Let's use these ideas to multiply a vector and a bivector. Let's say we wanted to multiply this vector with this bivector. They have a direction in common, so we cancel that direction. Then the product is just this vector. Notice that this is the same as saying that multiplying a vector by i rotates it by a right angle, which I mentioned in the Swift introduction. To multiply a vector with a perpendicular bivector, we need to go to three dimensions. Let's say we wanted to multiply this vector with this bivector. Then all we have to do is join them together into this trivector. Just like how describing the product of parallel and perpendicular vectors allowed us to calculate the product of arbitrary vectors, we can now find the product of any vector with any bivector. Let's figure out the product of this vector with this bivector. To do this, we can take this perpendicular line and use it to split v into two parts, one which is parallel to b and the other which is perpendicular to b. At this point, we can distribute. Now the first term is the product of a vector and a parallel bivector, which we know rotates the vector by a right angle, and the second term is the product of a vector and a perpendicular bivector, which we know is this trivector. Again, we can think of this as splitting the product into two pieces, one where we multiply b with the part of v that is inside b, and the other where we multiply b with the part of v that is outside b. Thus, we again call these two parts of the whole product the inner and outer products. However, things are a bit different when we consider the product of two bivectors. When we have two parallel bivectors, all of the directions end up canceling and we are left with a scalar. When we have two bivectors that are perpendicular like this, these directions will cancel and the result is this bivector. Unlike with vectors, there's actually a third case when you are multiplying two bivectors. However, you need four dimensions to describe it, so I'll have to start getting more abstract. Let's say we are working in a space with an orthogonal basis given by E1, E2, etc. Then going back to the previous cases, the case with parallel bivectors was that E1, E2 times E1, E2 is a scalar. The next case, where the bivectors were partly perpendicular, was that E1, E2 times E2, E3 is a bivector. The final case is where both bivectors are completely perpendicular to each other. I'm not going to try to draw this because it can only happen in four dimensions, but we can describe it algebraically as considering what E1, E2 times E3, E4 is. Because all of the directions involved are perpendicular, they will join together to produce a 4 vector. Then when we want to find the product of two arbitrary bivectors, after distributing, we will have all three of these cases. Thus, the general product between two bivectors is the sum of a scalar term, a bivector term, and a 4 vector term. We call the scalar part of this product the inner product, and we call the 4 vector part of this product the outer product. What we see here is that for bivectors, it is not the case that their product is the sum of their inner and outer products because there is an extra bivector term. This argument can be generalized to show that the product of an r vector with an s vector is an absolute value of r minus s vector plus an absolute value of r minus s plus 2 vector plus an absolute value of r minus s plus 4 vector, and so on until you hit an r plus s vector. This formula is the most general way to decompose a product in geometric algebra. Another thing that I neglected to mention in my original video is that there are other flavors of geometric algebra. Up to this point, I have only been focusing on vanilla geometric algebra, usually called VGA for short.
there are two main differences between the different flavors. First, while vectors always square to a scalar, some flavors have non-zero vectors that square to non-positive values. For example, in space-time algebra, you have some basis vectors that square to a negative value, and in PGA, you have a basis vector that squares to zero. The second difference between the flavors is that some flavors start from a completely different linear space. For example, while VGA starts from the linear space of oriented line segments, PGA starts from the linear space of lines in 2D or planes in 3D. These new flavors raise a new issue. This description of the geometric product that I gave relies on the idea of vectors being oriented line segments. That means that this way of thinking about the geometric product only works in VGA. Thus, we're going to need another way to think about the geometric product that works in all flavors. So let's go back to trying to understand the geometric product, this time trying to do it in such a way that it can be generalized to other flavors. The one thing that we know is that in all flavors, a vector squared is a scalar. Now let's think about the product of two vectors, a and b. As it currently stands, we can't really figure out anything about this product. But what if we multiply another vector by this product? In two dimensions, you can confirm that the product of three vectors is always another vector, so if we restrict our attention to two dimensions for the moment, what we now have is a function that takes in a vector and produces another vector. Now by the distributivity and associativity of the geometric product, we see that this function is a linear transformation. But what linear transformation is this? Well, if we think about the effect of this linear transformation on A, we see that the result is just a scalar multiple of B, because we know that A squared is a scalar. As I said before, we can forget about scalar factors for now for the sake of understanding, so let's drop A squared. So we see that the effect of the linear transformation brings A to B. It's important to remember that this only works in two dimensions, although in higher dimensions we can often get away with considering the two-dimensional subspace containing A and B. Let's summarize what we've done here. Multiplying a vector by the product AB is a linear transformation that brings A to B. Now at this point, we still don't have quite enough information to figure out what exactly this linear transformation is, but usually the simplest guess is the correct one. For example, let's look back at VGA. Say that you have two vectors A and B. What linear transformations will bring A to B? Well, an obvious one is the rotation that brings A to B. As we saw in the original video, this guess is correct. Multiplying a vector by AB rotates it by the angle between A and B. Now we already calculated AAB, but what about BAB? Multiplying by AB rotates by the angle between A and B, so we start with B and then rotate by that angle. So this vector here is BAB. Notice that this vector is the reflection of A across the line made by B. Thus, in general, this sandwich product is the way to do reflections in geometric algebra. Now that we understand how the geometric product gives us this formula for reflections, let's study reflections in greater detail. For example, what if we wanted to reflect the result of this reflection by another vector? To reflect BAB across C, we can just make another sandwich. But now look at this expression. We know that ABC rotates A by the angle between B and C, and in the original video we saw that multiplying by CB on the left is the same as multiplying by BC on the right, so CBABC is just ABC rotated by the angle between B and C again. Thus, we see that two reflections is just a rotation. More precisely, reflecting a vector through B and then through C is the same as rotating by twice the angle between B and C. Now this formula for reflecting twice might be starting to look familiar. That is because this formula is actually the formula for three-dimensional rotations that we derived in the original video. So the idea of a rotation being two reflections works in more than two dimensions. However, there is an issue with this way of describing reflections. Consider this way of doing reflections in three dimensions. What if we wanted to reflect across the z-axis?
reflecting this vector across the z-axis produces this vector, and reflecting this vector across the z-axis produces this vector. However, notice that reflecting across the z-axis is just the same thing as rotating halfway around the z-axis. The issue is that in three dimensions, we don't usually care about reflecting across a line. Instead, we like to think about reflecting across a plane. There are a few approaches we can use to try to fix this. One approach is to replace the vector on the outside of the expression for reflections with a bivector. The issue with this is that while it does work for bivectors, it doesn't work with higher dimensional objects without including some negative signs that depend on the dimension. Another approach, which is probably the most common, is to always insert a minus sign into the expression. When we do this, we are actually reflecting u across the plane that is perpendicular to v. While this does work, it causes us to start thinking about normal vectors again, which I would rather not do. However, there is another option. We could use PGA, which is one of the other flavors of geometric algebra. So let's put off this problem for the moment and explore PGA. To make things simpler, let's jump back to two dimensions for now. Notice that when describing reflections and rotations using VGA, we were stuck with only being able to describe reflections and rotations around the origin. This stems from the fact that in VGA, we don't care about the exact position of vectors. For example, we say that all of these vectors are equal. What that means is that when it comes to reflections, we consider all of these lines to be equal. So what would happen if we did not consider these lines to be equal? If we want to do geometric algebra on these lines, we need to find a way to represent lines in two dimensions as a linear space. To do this, notice that the equation for a line looks somewhat like a linear combination. So to represent lines in the plane as a linear space, we could pick three basis vectors e1, e2, and e0 and associate a given vector with the line given by this equation. Now when we do geometric algebra with these vectors, it turns out that we need e0 to square to 0 instead of 1, but other than that, all of the algebraic rules are the same. So now how do we understand the geometric product in PGA? The same as before! Say that you had two vectors a and b. From our previous arguments, the product AB is a linear transformation that brings A to B. So what linear transformation will bring A to B? Again, an obvious one is the rotation that brings A to B, and it turns out that this guess is correct. Now the same argument from before shows that BAB will reflect A across B. Now you might think that we haven't gained much since this looks just like the situation we had before with VGA, but notice that we can now move these lines anywhere on the plane, and the result is still true. Thus, we have now managed to describe reflections across lines that do not go through the origin. Another thing that's nice is that this way of reflecting works for points as well. In two-dimensional PGA, points are represented by bivectors. We can reflect this point across B using the same formula as before. Once again, we can talk about rotations by composing two reflections. In this case, we have rotated P around the intersection of B and C by twice the angle between B and C. Now I do want to warn you that unlike in VGA, the one-sided rotation formula does not work. The reason for this is that even though we are working in two geometric dimensions, the linear space of lines is actually three-dimensional, so it requires the two-sided rotation formula. Now what if we were to try to rotate with two parallel lines? Well, after reflecting twice, we see that the point has simply moved in a direction perpendicular to the lines. You can work out that this distance is twice the distance between B and C. So we see that in PGA, we can describe translations in the same way as rotations. Because we can keep adding more reflections, this means that we can compose an arbitrary number of reflections, rotations, and translations together. In fact, with enough reflections, it turns out that we can describe any rigid transformation in the plane. So then what about PGA in three dimensions? Well, in two dimensions, our vectors had three components and represented lines in the plane. To move to three dimensions, we could just add another component, but now what do these vectors represent? By analogy with two dimensions, 
they should be the geometric object represented by this equation. This is the equation for a plane, showing that in three-dimensional PGA, vectors are planes. Now this actually provides the solution to our three-dimensional reflection problem. Like in two dimensions, calculating the sandwich product with a vector reflects across that vector. This is now a reflection across a plane, not a line, so we finally have a decent way to calculate reflections in three dimensions. While it can be a bit hard to visualize in three dimensions, rotations and translations are still the composition of two reflections, and any rigid transformation in 3D space can be written as the composition of enough reflections. Thus, for applications such as rigid body dynamics or computer graphics where you want to describe rigid transformations, you probably want to use PGA. Now as one final example of this way of thinking of the geometric product, let's briefly look at conformal geometric algebra. Now I'm going to be honest, I know very little about CGA. I'm planning on learning more about it eventually, but my focus has currently been elsewhere. However, even with limited knowledge, we can figure out a lot about how CGA works by doing the same thing that we did earlier in the video. In CGA, we can have vectors be circles. But how can we represent circles using some kind of linear combination? We can actually figure out a lot without knowing how to do this, so I am purposely not going to say how it is done. The question I want to answer is the one that we have been answering this whole video. How do we think about the product of two vectors? In this case, we are trying to understand the product of two circles. Well, like before, we know that the product AB represents a linear transformation that brings A to B, at least in the two-dimensional subspace that A and B are in. So if we apply this linear transformation to B, it should become some smaller circle. But now notice that if we take this sandwich product and perform another sandwich with B, the result is just a scalar multiple of A, since B squared is a scalar. Now scaling doesn't really affect the shape of the circles in this linear space, so B squared A B squared represents the same circle as A does. Thus, sandwiching with B brings points from outside B to inside B, and points from inside B to outside B. If you know enough geometry, you might realize that this looks like a circle inversion, and it turns out that this guess is correct. In CGA, the sandwich product with a circle is a circle inversion. Furthermore, we can combine any number of circle inversions to produce many different transformations. In fact, we can get any conformal transformation this way, just like how we could get any rigid transformation in PGA. So if you are doing an application that needs conformal transformations, you probably want to use conformal geometric algebra. Now, this video and the swift introduction both moved very quickly through all of the topics that were discussed. If you want a slower and more thorough introduction to geometric algebra, I would suggest my video series From Zero to Geo, where we develop geometric algebra from the ground up. While it's currently still just about the basics of vectors, I'm hoping that it eventually could be used as a textbook to learn basic geometric algebra. I hope to see you there!